Hello there, here we are with the bonus issue for issue 52. And so let's go ahead and get started. So this issue was a little bit interesting because, and I'll talk about it here in a little bit, so I don't want to spoil the surprise. Uh, so this is the Carrot Class Cruiser, technical specifications. It's from the DeMorean uh, Manufacturing Corporation. It's a light cruiser, 350 meters long, 72 meters wide, 75 meters high. Uh, it's got an 80 megalite uh, speed, which is pretty quick for a cruiser. Um, it's got a class one hyperdrive, which is definitely fast. Excuse me, forward and aft deflector field generators, 10 heavy turbo lasers, 20 ion or laser cannons, uh, five tractor beam projectors, and a crew of 1,092, or it can operate with a minimum of two. So I don't know how it can have that many pe crew on it. If you look at it, it doesn't look like it could support that many crew, but apparently it can. So, uh, interesting. And it can have 142 passengers. Uh, so here we go. Let's go ahead and get started. While the wedge shaped Star Destroyer was the most familiar symbol of the Imperial Navy power, the Empire enforced rule through many smaller vessels that uh, formed the backbone of the fleet. One of the most important of these workhorses operated by the Imperial Navy was the handy and very reliable Carrick class cruiser designed and built by the DeMorean Manufacturing Corporation on the planet Esselis. Uh, although intended as cheap alternative to larger capital ships, these 350 meter uh, vessels were heavily armed for their size and fully capable uh, trading fire with larger uh, adversaries, even though they were not designed to operate as ships of the line. These ships first went into service on the side of the Republic in the Clone Wars when they were used as high-speed escorts for uh, larger vessels such as Dreadnought-class heavy cruisers. When they were first taken over by the Empire, Carrot-class ships were used in a sm similar way of that of the Karelian Corvette employed by the Rebel Alliance and were often dispatched to patrol systems, star systems in the core worlds and corporate sectors. Firepower and speed. It was not long before the Imperial strategies, strategists realized the ship's potential for serving in an anti-starfighter role over planets or in a fleet defense screen. Uh, considering their size, the Carrot class was notable for uh, an oppressive array of weapons. The ship was built with Two different configurations, one featuring uh, 10 heavy turbo lasers for attack and 20 laser cannons for defense. The second version, designated as Carrick A variants, the turbo lasers were replaced with the same number of ion cannons. Both variants also included five tractor beams and uh, to snare enemy uh, disabled ships. Uh, either type of armament could, with uh, Coupled with the impressive speed and the maneuverability of the cruiser made it a uh, highly versatile ship. It was not unusual for a ship of Carrot class cruisers to defeat a starship ten times larger than themselves. For a capital ship, the cruiser was very fast. Capable, capable of speeds of me uh, 80 megalites, the cruiser was comparable to that of an Incom 65 X-Wing starfighter, and at full throttle in a running engagement, could intercept and attack most enemies. Uh, in open space, a carrot class vessel could outrun most threats that uh, it could not fend off, and if needed, it was fast and tough enough to break through even sizable blockade fleet. Pardon me. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the mounting here. Um, despite the ship size, the layout of the carrot hull uh, left no room for any internal hangar bays. As a stopgap, the uh, stopgap measure, flight racks, uh, flight racks gantries were enabled to, or were added to the exterior of the hull uh, late in the design process. These were uh, each able to mount up to five TIE fighters, uh, which could be deployed for reconnaissance, carrier, or patrol missions. Uh, their use was unusual, however, and carrier class. Cruisers normally relied on their ships to supply cover in combat situations. And then this down here is just talking about how uh, 
the whole ship could operate with just two people. It was very simple to operate. So, sorry, I just got an itchy eye there. Tough structure, the Care Class Cruiser's internal space uh, featured unique compartment systems and syst uh, consisting of high-density overlapping armor plates uh, set along the forward and central hull. Uh, though they took up a lot of space, the inclusion of these uh, self-contained compartments with the automatic hatches gave the cruiser a greater chance of survival after suffering one of the various dangers facing any large uh, spacecraft, such as the hull breach, when in addition to the armor plating of the hull, the cruiser featured a more standard deflector shield grid. The cruiser did not have did have some weaknesses, for example, the relatively light protection of the hull around its aft ionization reactor made the ship vulnerable for a proton torpedo or laser bolt, uh, which could, if fired with enough precision, knock out the main reactor core and leave the ship and its crew powerless and adrift. However, despite this area of weakness, the efficiency of the compartment system and deflector shield grid still ensured the carrot class uh, could withstand multiple penetrating hits that might well have crippled larger vessel. It was not unusual for stricken cruisers to be recovered after battle with some members of the crew still alive in their sealed compartments. Because of this, the cruiser got a reputation as a good gig among crews and became one of the more popular postings in the Imperial Navy. Continued service due to these uh, hard wearing ve uh, vehicles, speed, armament, and the hull protection, Imperial Navy strategists were slow to retire them, and the Carrot class remained in operation in one form or another throughout the Imperial era. They were often used to transport personnel, including planetary governors, admirals, sector moths, and other uh, Imperial dignitaries. It was not uncommon to see pairs of Carrot class cruisers standing in for some battle-ready starfighters as system patrol vessels uh, being sent to quieter areas of Imperial space and challenging the invisible hand. Uh, and this is for the Battle of Coruscant. During the Battle of Coruscant, Carrot class cruisers uh, formed part of their Coruscant home fleet that protected the capital of the Republic. Among those assigned to the Home Fleet Strike Group 5 was the Integrity, commanded by Lorth Nita, uh, who would later go on to be Distinguished Imperial Career. Uh, Nita uh, trapped the Separatist flagship Imper uh, Invisible Hand, commanded by the cyborg General Grievous, and demanded its surrender. Nita did not believe the General's claims that the Supreme Chancellor Palpatine was a prisoner on board and gave Grievous ten minutes to prove his claim before the massed ships of Strike Group 5 opened fire. Grievous did not surrender, uh, but ba Palpatine was rescued by uh, Jedi Generals Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi. So yeah, uh, if you guys recognize the name Nita, uh, yeah, go back and watch Empire Strikes Back. Strikes Back. That's where you'll hear more about Nita. The History of Nymoidia. So this one's actually pretty interesting. So um, I'll get into it. So first, before we get into this, so if you'll notice, there's no behind the scenes um, for the Carrot class uh, Imperial gunship. Also, um, there's none for the uh, for the history of Nymoidia either. So that's kind of interesting. It's not often that there's nothing that's a uh, behind the scenes for these. Okay, let's get into this. History of Nymoidia. Um, so, the Duros explorers uh, struck out from their home world in the Cord and expanded their influence across the galaxy during the, uh, an era when exploration was at its peak. A species of naturally inquisitive explorers, the Duros, found the world of Nymoidia and colonized it, taking it as our own. Nymoidia quickly established itself as a, an allied but separate entity in, uh, to the home world. And so, okay, so it's important to know what are the Nymoidia. So the Nymoidians 
are the ones that was part of the Trade Federation that was blocking uh, or or uh, blockading uh, Naboo. So um, that's the Nymoidians. So it's important to note who they are so you can understand this. Uh, so they're descendants from the Duros. So the while the inhabitants of the Duro uh, focused their energies on the vital skills and exploration of astrogation, those who lived in on Nymoidia set their sights on acquisition of profit in an asset-rich galaxy. Expanding their influence faster than anyone could imagine, the establishment of the trade guilds brought a new level of control over the vast expansion of civilization throughout the galaxy. To process the Nymoidia, uh, a process that Nymoidia was determined to be the at the forefront. 10,000 years after the settlement of Nymoidia, the physical differences between the Duro and the Nymoidians uh, are clear to see. Uh, living on dull, a dull, foggy, human world with a hazy gravity, with a heavy gravity, had wrought subtle changes over the Nymoidians across the millennia to the point that the two had evolved into distinctly separate species. So that's pretty interesting. So they were, uh, the Nymoidians were descendants of the Duros and they end up, be, end, end up being actually two distinctly different species due to evolution. So right here, I'm going to share a picture of uh, a Duros and then a picture of uh, some Nymoidians. Um, so technically Duros, two Duros, and uh, Nymodians. Um, so, uh, yeah, hopefully you can see the difference there. Uh, for those that have watched uh, Clone Wars, uh, you may remember, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, gosh, I can't remember his name now. He was a bounty hunter, wore a big brimmed hat. Um, gosh, it was on my, on my, uh, Right at the tip of my tongue earlier. Um, I can't think of him now. Anyway, so there's a bounty hunter who was a Duros. Wore a big brimmed hat and uh, Cad Bane is his name. So uh, if you watched uh, Clone Wars, you'd be familiar with the character Cad Bane. He's a Duros. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. That helps give you a little bit of understanding. So, uh, just kind of go through this quickly. So, basically, Nymoidia then had these separate worlds that were kind of uh, close by. And uh, so they had Kato, Deku, and Koru, Nymoidia. Uh, and they... So, those... Um, the Nymoidians began to establish what became known as purse worlds, striking out to locate, colonize, and generate profits from uh, Kato, Deku, and Koru, Naimodia. Uh, so soon bypassed by its pure, uh, purse worlds, Naimodia became began to refer to itself as pure Naimodia. So <clears throat> the purse worlds, these other ones, they got to be more successful and they made more profits. And so basically, you know, they were part of the Trade Federation. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be part of the Trade Federation, it's going to be all about profits. So that's what their their society was all about. And basically all the purse worlds, um, they became more successful than pure Narmoidia. And um, for the most part, the people that lived on pure Narmoidia were... Man, it's so hard to say. <clears throat> Try it. Uh, those people were less successful. There's a lot of poverty and all that kind of stuff, uh, except for the ruling class that was there. They, you know, obviously, uh, they obviously did not have a problem. So, like, it talks here, those that remained were uh, often underfed worker drones. Uh, apart from the ruling government and the houses of the trade monarchy, very few chose to stay on the planet out of uh, choice. So, yeah. So, basically, if you're part of the ruling government, uh, you would be definitely well off there. So, yeah, that's, I mean, for the most part, it, 
from there it just kind of talks about it becoming the trade federation and then becoming part of the um the cis and blah 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 and all that kind of stuff um and this is just basically talking about its outer posts and the purse worlds and its influence and all that kind of stuff so yeah there you go interesting stuff <clears throat> escape pods part one part one okay so, under Galactic Law, Starship captains and crews are required to give their passengers a safety briefing before lifting off. During their uh, preparation for blasting into space, passengers were told of the procedures they must follow should the ship-wide, should ship-wide evacuation be necessary in the event of an emergency. On ships that are specifically designed for passenger transport, emergency lighting will usually illuminate the ship's corridors and point to the emergency exits. Aboard a multi-purpose vessel such as the YT-1300 light freighter, the crew are normally responsible for guiding passengers to escape pods via the main corridor. Launching an escape pod. In most ships, escape pod entry is through an ingress-egress hatch on the nose of the pod, which, depending on installation, will probably involve uh, each escapee lowering themselves into the pod. In the case of the popular Karelian Engineering Corporation Class 6 pod, the manufacturer recommends that the escapee should then trap themselves in before uh, closing the hatch. From the small control built into the escape pod, an escapee can close the hatch and launch the pod. The launch involves the release of three docking clamps caused by separate charges, by separator charges. There is no need to be alarmed at the small explosions, nor the sudden thrust created by the either pneumatics or ballistics, which shoot the pod from the mother ship like a projectile. Uh, a sensor band encircling the pod scans for the nearest habitable planet, uh, busy space lane, or station, and helps escapees guide the pod there and activate the emergency distress beacon. Escape pods, regardless of size, are mostly not designed for long distances, uh, distance travels, uh, fueled only with enough to get the escape pod to safety and land the pod safely. Some high-end luxury pods, mainly found on top-class passenger liners or luxury, or luxuriously appointed private vessels, do have admittedly slow hyperdrives and come with rather luxurious fixtures and fittings. Onboard scanners uh, monitor the life signs of the passengers as an automation kicks in should the passengers lose consciousness. Each escape pod contains a standard survival kit, which includes food and water for five days, uh, a survival shelter medical pack, a breathe mask, glow rods, and portable communication units. Um, so the layout for the escape pods uh, if you were to ask a Krillian Engineering Corporation how many escape pods uh, come pre-installed with the YT-1300 freighter, they would probably answer however many it needs. Obviously, any YT-1300 built for a crew of two engaged in uh, freight hauling have far less need for extra escape pods than YT-1300s built to ferry passengers from one spaceport to the next. Uh, the ship's versatility in a galaxy of diverse users, uses presented engineering brains at the Carillion Engineering Corporation with a, cha pardon me, a challenge to come up with a design that could accommodate however many escape pods were necessary for each customer uh, custom-built YT-1300. Their solution was to build a row of escape pod bays uh, in the aft section of the Starship. These could either accommodate escape pods or be swapped out for cargo storage if extra pods were not required. Another part of the Krillian Engineering Corporation engineers solution was to design a series of different sized escape pods from small one person models to larger lifeboats capable of carrying multiple passengers to safety. The various classes of escape pods uh, could be configured uh, whatever way the engineers deemed was necessary to nestle in the aft of the starship, ready to launch into action at the slightest hint of an emergency. Pardon me. <clears throat> the Millennium Falcon's pods. The Millennium Falcon uh, carries five Engineering Corporation Class 1 escape pods in her aft section, but Han Solo and Chewbacca never escaped 
I expected to use one. For one thing, Solo would never envi uh, could never envision uh, a situation where uh, he would be required to abandon ship. For another thing, Chewbacca's massive hairy frame was far too big to squeeze into one of these Class 1 escape pods, and Solo would never leave him behind. Their pair would rather take their chances from the cockpit than uh, try and escape in what Solo mockingly called a space coffin, a reference to the pod's basic shields and limited passenger uh, flight control. However, the Falcon's array of escape pods came in useful before she was uh, captured by the first Death Star, Solo and Chewbacca at Ben Kenobi's prompting jettisoned some escape pods to make it appear as though they were abandoned. Uh, they had abandoned ship. In truth, the crew, uh, ship's crew and passengers had concealed themselves in the Falcon's well-hidden smuggling compartments under the floor, as you all are very aware. So this is our behind-the-scenes up here, and this is pretty interesting. The re redesign of the Millennium Falcon. So uh, we've talked about this many times. This is what the original Millennium Falcon was supposed to look like. It was changed up because this looked too much like a ship from a TV show over in England. When the Falcon is drawn into the Death Star's hangar in the first Star Wars movie, one of the Imperial officers examined, examining the Falcon aboard the Death Star tells Darth Vader that several escape pods have been jettisoned from the ship. However, it's not clear um, where such pods would have been located, something that uh, would have been much more obvious before the Falcon's last-minute redesign. In one of the original sketches, the escape pods were clearly visible from the outside. So these would have been the escape pods. So there's like three of them missing there. So, um, yeah, so that would have been pretty interesting. Um, so that concludes this bonus issue of uh, the issue 52. And again, now this is talking about distressing the surface, so you're going to do some painting and then actually scratch and, and sand the surface down to give different effects. So that'll be something that I'll have to be looking into when I go to start painting the exterior. That concludes issue 52. And again, for issue 53, we're going to get one of those uh, recessed parts that go, go inside the hull. And a bunch of piping and some some uh, details and some more framework. So we'll see how all that goes. So that concludes issue 52, everyone. I want to thank you all for uh, watching. Again, I want to remind everybody that today is Make Solo 2 Day. Uh, Make Solo 2 Day Happen Day. Uh, if you're so inclined, please go check out the Star Wars News Net uh, stream tonight. It's on their YouTube channel. And I believe it's going to be at 8.30 Eastern, so uh, plan accordingly. So it's 8.30 Eastern, 7.30 Central, and 5.30 Pacific. And for you mountain time, that'd be 6.30 in case you guys couldn't do math. Um, so there you go. Uh, check that out. I think it's going to be really good. These guys usually do a great job. And uh, if you want to talk about the movie Solo, uh, that will definitely be the place to be. So check that out. Um, and with that, I'm going to say, may the Force be with you always.